Good morning, everybody. Had to get a couple things arranged up here before I got started. Glad to see you here this morning. We're going to start off with song number 337. Uh, after this song, we'll have our script reading. This time we'll have our script reading. Now, please, now therefore I have showed, I, therefore I have found favor in your sight. Please, please show me your, now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Thank you, Luke. 346, after this song, uh, we'll have our opening prayer. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me alone. Yeah. 
Would you bow with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come here this morning and to learn more about what you'd have us to do through your word and and sing praises unto you. And, and we know that there is no more important place for us to be than right here at this time this morning. And we know how important your church is to you. And we ask that you'd help us to remember that each day of our lives. And as a part of that church, help us to live our lives so that our light might shine and that we, we might reflect you in our lives. Lord, we pray for our, for our country. We live in a country that increasingly seems to not know you or your word. And we ask that you'd be with those that lead and help them to do the things that you would have them to do. Do it in the right way. And we know that so many times in today's world, um, they are not doing that. And we ask you to be with them and help us not to become a people that calls evil good and good evil like you told us in scripture, but to be the, be the shining light that you want us to be. And Lord, we ask you to be with those that are not here today because of sickness and uh, illness and diseases that they need your helping hand. And we ask that you'd be with the doctors and nurses that are working with them that they might be able to help them to get well and help them to return to us soon. And we ask that you'd be with the be with our military, be with our first responders, that, that they might be safe in, while they're performing their duties. And Lord, we ask you to be with us now as we go through this service and guard, guide, and direct us and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. One twenty two will be the song for the communion thought this morning. Since the love of God is shed, Christ has blessed you on my head.
You folks out there that are my age may remember a song by Gilbert O'Sullivan. He recorded in 1972. It's called Alone Again Naturally. And it is widely thought to be one of the saddest songs ever written and recorded. And I think if you're not familiar with it, I think you'll soon see why that is the case. Part of the song goes like this. To think that only yesterday I was cheerful, bright and gay, looking forward to, but who wouldn't do, the role I was about to play. But as if to knock me down, reality came around, and without so much as a mere touch, cut me into little pieces, leaving me to doubt, talk about God and his mercy. Oh, if he really does exist, why did he desert me? In my hour of need, I truly am indeed alone again, naturally. Then he goes on. Now looking back over the years and whatever else that appears, I remember I cried when my father died, never wishing to hide the tears. And at 65 years old, my mother, God rest her soul, couldn't understand why the only man she had ever loved had been taken leaving her to start with a heart so badly broken, despite encouragement from me, no words were ever spoken. And when she passed away, I cried and cried all day, alone again, naturally. It is a sad, sad song. And when I think about the words of this song and what he's trying to convey, and I look at our world today, I see a sad, sad world. I see a sad society that in so many ways is alone and really experiencing loneliness in their lives. And I think about how can, in a world of social media that people rely so much on today, how can we be so alone? How can we be so lonely. I think probably there are folks out here who have experienced this aloneness. I've shared this several times over the years that when my dad died in 1993, I remember my mother saying to me, in a house full of of church folks and neighbors that she had known her entire life. I feel so alone. And I think that's our world. You know, there's an epidemic, a health crisis in our society. And there's a lot of excuses that people give for it. But I think a lot of it is people don't know how to deal with Loneliness, and they don't know where to find purpose for their lives. We have an advantage as believers because we have someone in our lives who understands loneliness. You remember these words of Jesus. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? As Jesus hung on the cross, truly alone, an aloneness that we can only imagine because none of us here have experienced the kind of loneliness that Jesus experienced as he hung on the cross. And so Jesus who promises to us to be with us, the Hebrew writer says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's God's promise to us. He's always there. Jesus told the disciples, as you go about doing the things I've called you to do, 
I am with you always to the very end of time. Wherever you go, I'm there, and I'll have what you need. So we know this about our Lord, of what he experienced. But let's be real about this. As humans, we need human, human touch at times, do we not? That's part of the problem of our society. We need that human touch. So we have a responsibility to be used by the Lord to help people who are alone. So just one more little text here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. We are blessed by God and his presence in our lives, and God calls us as his children to remember that when people are struggling, we need to reach out and be that presence of God in their lives. Jesus suffered unimaginable physical pain, and he suffered a, a, the darkness of aloneness that we can't really even imagine. And he did it for us so that he would that so that we would know that he's present with us and will have all the help we need. So as we take the supper, remember his sacrifice and what he did for us. Let's remember that purpose that he gives us as humans to not only reach out to him, but to reach out to each other. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. Thank you for giving this example of his flesh and his blood. And thank you for the purity that you give us the chance to get. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for everything that you have given to us, Lord. Thank you for your son that you sent to this earth to die on the cross for us, Lord. Lord, we ask that as we partake of this cup that represents his blood, that, Lord, you help us do so in a manner well pleasing unto you, Lord. Lord, help us to become worthy in your eyes as Christians. Help us to do um, all that we are needed to do, Lord. Help us And help us to do what is right, Lord. We pray all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Song number 96 will be the song before the lesson this morning. So if you're willing and able, let's be standing at this time. Beautiful me. 
Good morning. So over the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about faith. We talked about seeking God. We talked about the word of God. We talked about being made aware of sin, and that's where we left off last week. And we mentioned in the class on Sunday evening, if you don't make it to the class, it is also uh, broadcast as well, so you could tune in. Um, but we have a wonderful time here in class where we speak about a lot of the same scriptures and we just ask each other, well, what, what do you see in this? What are you thinking? What impresses you? Uh, and so we get a chance to share in the fellowship of discussion about God's word. One of the things that uh, was brought up is this idea that <clears throat> we don't look for a savior until we know we need one. If I'm a strong swimmer and I'm in the middle of the water, someone throws a lifesaver at me, I'd say, what are you doing that for? I might think, I'm Michael Phelps. But if you could hear the music from Jaws playing in the air, you don't even know where the speakers are at, but you just hear, no, 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 no. Now you might grab onto that life and say, pull me in, pull me in now. I know I'm a strong swimmer, but when I realize the danger, that's when I look for salvation. I think part of the problem um, that we experience in our own lives, in our own relationship with God, is that we don't see the danger that we're in. So we say, no, I'm cool. I'm good. I've got this. <laughs> if only we knew we would look for a savior. Last week we talked about sin and in Romans chapter 7, verses 24, we see that Paul writes, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I made the statement, if you couldn't say the last part, thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord, if you couldn't say that, this is what you'd be left with. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. And then crickets. It's important that we did talk about sin last week. It's also important that I don't immediately jump to, but, but it's all right, it's all right. No, it's not all right. If you are living in sin, if you are living apart from God, if you cannot call Jesus Christ your Savior, it's not all right. You don't got this. You need a Savior. This week, we're speaking about the cross. How does God save us from our sin sickness, from our issues with sin? It's through the cross. Open up in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. See, God has always had a plan for our salvation, and the plan for our salvation was always through Jesus' death on the cross. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. I have a lot of the verses up here since we're using a lot of different verses today. I would like you, though, if you have your Bible, to open up your Bible. Because I had to type these in. I could have made up everything that's on the screen. You don't know. Open your Bible and examine what I'm saying against Scripture to make sure that what I'm saying is true. Now, I know me. You don't know me. But this is a good practice for anyone. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. This wasn't something that was an afterthought. God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. 
So to speak a little bit about this deliberate plan, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. In that last verse, what you have is Peter saying, you were responsible. Just as a little bit of background as y'all are turning to Isaiah 53. In Acts chapter 2, it's actually Pentecost, 50 days removed from the Passover feast. Not everyone who's standing before him would have physically been right there at the cross. I don't believe so. But still, Peter is very deliberate about saying, you put him to death. And with the understanding that this was God's deliberate plan of salvation. Yes, I put him to death. My sin is the reason why he had to die on that cross. Going back to Isaiah chapter 53. We'll start in verse 1. And if you're aware from the last couple conversations we had, this is also where the eunuch was reading when Philip began with that very passage of scripture and shared with him the good news about Jesus. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Just this first couple of verses, the picture that is being painted of Jesus is one where anyone would feel sort of sorry for him. You'd feel sympathy here and you'd say, man, this guy seems like he has been drugged behind on the road. Just This is just a horrible situation for this person to be in. He had no beauty or majesty, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Continuing on. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Just going a little bit further here, now you're, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, so he, he was punished for me, yet I didn't recognize it, and I just thought, you're, <laughs> look at you, God must be mad at you. What did you do that was, man, be horrible to be you. Meanwhile, all that he's going through is because of me. He endured all of this for my sins, for my failings to measure up to the righteousness of God. By his wounds, I'm healed. And then that last part, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I don't know if you've ever been responsible for a little child. Let me, let me add a little caveat. A little child that you're not allowed to spank. You know there's a difference, right? There's a child that you're allowed to spank, there's always the threat of, I better stop and listen because, yeah, the last time I did that, <laughs> the last time I did that, it was like something stung me right on my backside, and I don't want to do that again. 
But now you're watching after a child who has no threat of that. And they keep running out to the street or something like that. You keep bringing them back, and you're like, okay, we're going to just put you in a room. I'm not going to do that. Man, that's difficult. (laughs) Because the child wants to do something that's going to harm them, and what I have in my toolkit is inadequate for me to guide this young child. You end up with the situation where, like, do I lock them in a room? Like, what? What do I do? Don't have me babysit your child's children, by the way. But it is very difficult. And you could read in Proverbs about keeping a fool from their folly. It doesn't have to be a little child. I remember when I was uh, a young minister, a church had invited us to come there and share with them How did you have such a successful campus ministry? I'd actually visited that church several times growing up, so I was a little familiar with the church. One of the other guys who was with me, a young guy, was not. And as he spoke, figuratively, he was lighting the fuse on a bomb. And the other two of us realized, like, Stop speaking for a second. Okay. (laughs) We diffused the whole situation. And he started speaking again. (laughs) We were like, please, stop speaking. And then he did it again, and then at that point, the whole conversation just derailed. That's the kind of behavior that I showed. It's for that behavior that the Lord laid on him my iniquity. I could tell you it was very frustrating with that guy. And we, when we went out to lunch, we talked to him. We were like, did you not realize that we tried to get you to stop several times from saying the exact same thing? The last statement that he said is, well, you called us here. And the way we did it is we didn't focus on the little stuff. <laughs> Never mind. Thank you for inviting us. We, we really enjoyed the opportunity to come here and talk to you. But we could see that that's not going to happen. It was very frustrating for me because I was like, I would have loved to have that conversation because we are about reaching out to the campuses, reaching out to the students. But for the sake of I don't know what you are after, that entire conversation was derailed. I bring that up just to, to try and give you this understanding of how frustrating my behavior should be to God. Yet, for that very behavior, God laid on Jesus my iniquity. Continuing on, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent, So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Tell me, please, Who's the writer talking about here? Is he talking about himself? Or is he talking about someone else? (laughs) To be going through all of this unjust treatment, he has done nothing wrong. I tell you what, it doesn't take me long to pipe up if someone starts to get harsh with me and I've done nothing wrong. I pipe up immediately. Now, why are you doing all this? I haven't done anything wrong. He did nothing wrong, yet he didn't speak up in his own defense. He was taken away. He was punished. He was killed. No one from his generation protested. The gravity of sin is death. 
who spoke about that, what I earn for sinning. I work very hard for my paycheck. And God's like, here's your paycheck. The paycheck is death. If I understand that, then the question now is, how do I feel that someone else went through that because of what I did? I've shared before, and I don't think my brother thought it was going to have this profound of an effect on me. My brother and I did things that were ill-advised often. Playing with a high bounce ball, you know those, those bouncy balls that you bounce it once and you go all over everything? In the foyer of our house where all of the porcelain uh, treasures were, I was very ill-advised. Gluing it back together <laughs> and putting it on the pedestal <laughs> as if no one was going to notice. That bird looks a little bit different. Also ill-advised. There was one time, and I can't even remember what it was for, but we both knew what the punishment was. My dad took us to his bedroom. He got his belt. And you could do almost anything but spank me. I'd be fine with it. You're grounded for three weeks. I got like 40 G.I. Joes. I'm going to have some major battles in my room. I'll be fine. But you're going to spank me today. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Please don't do that. Well, my brother got it first. And my dad said, Aurelio. And my brother stopped him and said, Dad, no, it was my fault. Spank me instead. <laughs> you heard him. <laughs> He's smarter than me. <laughs> I have no disagreement. And my dad looked at me and said, Remember this. And he did not spank him any differently that second time from the first time. My dad could have been like, just a little tap. I'm proud of what you did. No, my dad said, no. He's going to get your punishment. I was surprised because my dad would spank for every syllable of the word. Sometimes you'd think of what you did. What did I do? Do not ever break or play with a high, oh my gosh, this is going to be a bad, a bad spanking. And I don't think that my brother knows how big that was to me. I think my father was trying to teach me exactly what I got from it. <clears throat> to watch my brother take the spanking that I deserved when I knew how much I hated being spanked. That is probably the moment when he was most my big brother. How does it make you feel to know that someone else took the punishment that you deserved upon themselves so that you could have joy. <clears throat> Turn to Matthew chapter 27. <clears throat> there is a plan, but as was already mentioned, there was a lot of pain in this plan. There was the pain that the cross brings or brought to Jesus. And I think, <clears throat> well, if you've ever seen the movie The Passion, it, it, it really does give you a very different perspective. I think sometimes I can minimize what pain was associated there. That's why we're going to look at Matthew chapter 27 here for just a moment. Here in Matthew chapter 27, we're going to start in verse 22. I'm going to read straight through, and then we're going to point out a couple things afterwards. But we're going to read 22 through 50. Now it's in the long chapter. All right, Matthew chapter 7. 
Nope, I'm sorry. Oh, where did they say it? 27. It's in the right one. Matthew 27, verse 22 through 50. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Pause for just a second. Bar. In scripture, like Barnabas, Barabbas. What does bar mean? Son of Abba. Abba means father. Barabbas. Son of some guy. Son of some dude. Son of a father. It's almost like calling him an illegitimate, illegitimate child. Another word for that would be a bastard. Who do you want me to release to you? Jesus, who's the son of God, or this guy who's the son of some dude? Because that seems like that's a nickname. Just like Barnabas was not his actual name, Barabbas seems to be what the people called him. Uh, he's that guy. He stirs up trouble. The son of some dude. I don't even know. I don't know who his father was. He's no one important. Maybe he doesn't even know who his father was. Give us Barabbas. Hmm. Verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, 
put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Couple things. Verses 26, 29, and 35 speak of physical pain that he endured. If you watch the movie The Passion, you see a whole bunch about this physical pain. Verses 22 and 23, 29, 30 and 31, and 50 speak of emotional pain. Realizing that the Jewish people were closer than many other people because they gathered together for Passover. Every year of your life, that was something you were supposed to do. You go to Jerusalem. So Jesus would have seen a whole bunch of people annually. All the people he knew and loved, all the people who he'd been visiting, everyone would have been there when he was on the cross. So these statements being made aren't just being made by total strangers. Some of these statements may be coming from someone who he has known for years. Verse 46 speaks of the spiritual pain, which we also talked about during the communion talk. If you're taking notes, write down Psalm 22. And why is that important? Because long before Jesus ever came to earth, Psalm 22 was written. When you read it, because I want you to read it when you go home, you'll see all of these events were spoken of more than 400 years before Jesus came by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Jesus died on the cross. If we go back to Isaiah chapter 53. Reading verses 10, 11, and 12. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many (coughs) and made intercession for the transgressors. (coughs) Jesus was my guilt offering. He was the offering for my sin. He bore my sins to the cross and made peace between God and me. Now, I keep saying that for me, for me, for me, for me, for me. I want you to understand it's also for you, but I'm not going to throw you under the bus. I'm going to talk about me and my sin. So then how do I respond to such a great gift? I can tell you this, when my brother took that spanking for me, He earned himself a solid week of me not messing with him. Solid. I was like, oh, it's it's not a week yet. Not going to mess with you. I was so impressed by what my brother did for me. It, it, It did last, I don't know exactly how long, but it lasted a little while, where it was on the forefront of my mind. What Jesus did for me is so much greater. Someone does something for me, and so I say, hey, I'm going to give you this card. Thank you. Someone does something even better for me. So I say, hey, you know what? I'm going to buy you this gift. Thank you. 
Someone does something even greater for me, and I say, my goodness, uh, do you want to be in my family? I'll marry my eldest son off to your daughter. No, I'm not doing that, Uriah. Don't worry about it. But we have different levels where we say, man, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do this for you. That's so amazing. I'm going to do. How do you repay Jesus? For dying on the cross. For all the pain that he endured leading up to that death so that I can have peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? I was an object of wrath, but now I am a child of God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So there's, there's the answer. How do I respond to such a great gift from God? Gratitude. I no longer live my life for myself. I live for the one who died for me and brought me peace with God. Christ's love compels me because I know what I was facing. I am compelled by the love of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. I wanted to read this verse because the purpose of the way I covered from last week to this is found in this verse. If someone heard the message last week, I did try to offer some hope, but I wanted to leave the gravity of sin in full view. Why? Because when I realize the trouble that I'm in, when I realize that I have bought death, I've worked hard for it, that might lead me to godly sorrow. Where I look to God and say, I can't believe I've done that to you. I am so sorry for what I've done to you. And what does godly sorrow lead to? Salvation. Worldly sorrow, that kind of sorrow that's like, man, I'd do it again. It just, it's horrible when you get caught. Now you got all this stuff to deal with and everyone's looking at you all sorts of different ways. That, that leads to death. But the kind of sorrow that stops and says, I never meant to do that. I did not understand what I was doing against you, God, and I am so sorry for that. Knowing that I'm a sinner prompts me to look for salvation. God's plan was that salvation would be made available through the cross. Consider what it took to bring me salvation. Knowing that and knowing that Jesus did pay the price, I can be assured that I can be completely saved through him and through his love.
The way that I show my gratitude is to live for Jesus. One brief thing, and I'm not going to go on too long about it. We talk about the body and the blood. <clears throat> We're going to talk more about it. But my flesh is a slave to sin. When Jesus died, he broke that bond. I have so much consequences in the back background of my life that I should have died a thousand times over. Jesus' blood took care of that. His blood takes care of our past. His death in the flesh takes care of our future. We are completely justified before God if we can call Jesus Christ our Lord. One last verse. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. If you're here today and you realize that you need that power in your life, the good news is that we could take care of that today. There's water behind us. We can study more. I can wait to eat. <laughs> we can study some more. And if you want to be baptized today, that's something that you can do. If, on the other hand, you're still just learning about it and you're saying, oh, I'm not sure, then think about whether or not you need this power in your life. Because the cross is God's power in your life to redeem you from death to life. If there's any way that we can help you or be of service to you, you have an opportunity to let us know right now while we stand and sing.
I'll just make this announcement first because I don't know if our brother Aaron is ready to announce this like he needs to be. We're going to have our fifth Sunday uh, fellowship meal. In conjunction with that, we will also have death by chocolate. I I didn't know if you were going to do that, so I had to be up here to say that. All right. So for some of you who are like, I don't like chocolate. First of all, we can pray for that. (laughs) But also, if you want to make a different dessert, you can bring other desserts. You could bring that cake that I like with the toffee on it. You could do that. But all the chocolate desserts will be, uh, I don't know, judged by all of us. We'll say which one is our favorite, and we'll give a prize for that. So remember that. That's going to be next week. Fifth Sunday fellowship meal potluck. So bring bring food, actually, not just dessert. The dessert is very important, but bring food. And uh, afterwards, we'll share in the death by chocolate. Oh, what was that? Death by chocolate competition. And so, um, just wanted to let y'all know that that's coming up. Be preparing for that for next week. I wouldn't have been as animated as he was, so I want to welcome everyone here this morning, and we're glad you chose to be here with us. We have a few, a good number of announcements, but before we get to those, if you would, fill out the cards and pass them to the two center aisles, and in in a moment, they'll be picked up. We're happy to announce the birth of Denver Copeland Davis. He was born Thursday morning to Rochelle and Jeremy Davis. Weighs in at seven pounds, 14 ounces, and 21 inches long. They're all doing good. And then I think there was a maybe announcement or a sign-up sheet for a meal train to gather meals for them for, for a while. And if you have any questions on that, you can, I think, see Lisa, if you would. Uh, we need to pray for Jan White's older brother. This is Mike Akers. He's been diagnosed with early but fast advancing dementia. They're asking for prayers that his heart and his soul will be open to God. Uh, We need to pray for Ronnie Burns. This is the father of Robin Anderson, and he's recovering from COVID. But is did he go to the hospital yesterday? Severe cancer. Okay, we we need to remember that that family and our prayers um, of of what they found out, and I think. Uh, Robin and them are home now and maybe on the way there. So um, t- tough time for the family, so let's remember them. Remember Charlotte Swenson, uh, she's recovering from pneumonia. I think she's doing better. And also we need to pray for Luke Click and his health. He's been prescribed some breathing treatments, and he's having some more tests, and along with that, Casey in her cancer care. Uh, the benefit was was very good last night. Uh, a, a great turnout uh, of folks coming together. You know, it goes along with uh, Glenn's talk about alone. Um, that's where we need to reach out and and, and touch and help one another, uh, be there for one another. And, and it was last night for Casey. RC Medcast blood tests are showing improvement. Uh, his results wasn't perfect, but his bodily is recovering some and uh, he's having issues with the blood loss and low iron. So I uh, talked to him yesterday and he, he seems to be doing better. They were going to stay in today, uh, just maybe not be exposed as much. And he's already mentioned the fifth Sunday potluck, so remember that the 29th, the death by chocolate, all the good stuff. It'll be right over here. Uh, fix a meal and uh, and come hungry. There's going to be a, a still a diaper drop for the Davis family. It's going to continue for the next few weeks. And if you're able, you can drop these diapers or wipes in a box in a foyer. Uh, diaper sizes from newborn to however, however age group. Go up from there. I don't know. But you can pick and choose. Go through their variety, please. Uh, remember Fred and his surgery this week? Uh, is it uh, this Wednesday, the 25th, in Frisco on his neck surgery? Remember him? 
And then we're still continuing through January for the local food pantry, a peanut butter and jelly, spaghetti and spaghetti sauce. You can drop it here in the back, and, and then that will be delivered. Our next Wednesday's evening meal will be February 1st. It's going to be pulled pork and fixing and chicken nuggets. That'll be it all of them, I suppose. And come early for, for Bible class dinner. Uh, that's about 530. And then we'll have services at 7. Remember the men's coffee at Tuesday morning, 6 o'clock. And the ladies' Bible class is Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Both of those are in the fellowship hall. And I'm still scheduled, supposed to have a pacemaker put in February the 6th. Uh, we'll see how that goes uh, with Peyton. Uh, many of you may, may know or may not. Um, she's, she's having a hard time walking and talking. And uh, just keep your, keep your prayers. I'm sorry. Uh, no visitors and calls right now. Let them work through it and see how that works out in the next few weeks. So if you would please keep, keep her in her prayers. Uh, are there any other announcements? If not, please stand and we'll be dismissed. One of three will be a uh, song forward dismissed. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for our ability to gather here this morning to hear your word. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that as we leave here today that you continue to watch over us, that you lead God, guard, direct us. Heavenly Father, many mentioned this morning, we're thankful for the healthy births. And Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those that are sick. Uh, we're ask that you continue to watch over them, that you are, are with them, that you give them strength. Heavenly Father, we ask that you're with their doctors and nurses and their families as they uh, support them and, and tend to their needs. Heavenly Father, just ask that you continue to bless each one of us. We're thankful for this community that we live in and, and the people that uh, come together to support uh, everyone in their time of need. And Father, we just ask that uh, in all things your will is done. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.